Great. Th uh, thanks, Luke. And also thank you to all of the organizers of GoRuco. This is my actually first time speaking at GoRuco. It's my first time giving like a programming-related talk. Uh, so thanks for having me. Maybe this is why the conference is ending. Okay, guys like me showing up. And usually uh, they say it's like hard to follow a great talk uh, like Andy's. It's also even harder to follow a talk when you're like trying to like desperately like dab the tears out of your eyes here. Um, the title of this talk is I Made a Huge Mistake, How We Got Services Wrong, and What We Learned Along the Way. Uh, I think this talk is a version of a talk that has probably given, been given a lot of different times and different flavors, so this is going to be our take uh, on this topic. Uh, it's going to tell the story of how a growing startup tried to break apart its Rails monolith uh, and some of our learnings along the way. The talk will be broken down into four talks, four sections, uh, a little bit about me, uh, some high-level discussion around like how do you break down a Rails monolith, when is the right time to do that. Uh, we'll end with five concrete tips, uh, or five sweet tips, uh, and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, my name's Kelly. I live in San Francisco. I've been there for three years. Uh, before that, uh, I was living here in New York. Glad to talk New York versus San Francisco at the after party. Uh, I live with uh, my fiance and our dog. Uh, we're getting married next summer. We're having a Twin Peaks themed wedding. I've been writing uh, Rails since about like 2005, uh, and I work at a company called Gusto, which does payroll benefits and HR software for small businesses in the US. We'll get into that in a little bit, but right now you're probably wondering, Let's talk about Greta, our dog. I figure uh, Tender Love is going to burn like 10 minutes talking about his cats. Uh, so I'm going to burn a slide or two talking about my dog here. Um, so Greta is a very uh, fashionable dog. Uh, she likes to keep up with the latest trends. Uh, she recently decided to uh, you know, redo, redo her hairstyle and go with an ombre coloring. She's also a very worldly dog. She likes to travel. She likes to have new experiences. Um, so she re recently brought back a kimono from Japan. That's not why we're here. <laughs> uh, we are here to talk about, I would say, Rails projects that push the limits of the framework. Um, I think Rails doesn't scale is one of the great lies uh, that's uttered by commenters on Hacker, Hacker News. Um, but there are times where you need to reach for different things, um, and that's what this talk is about. There's a caveat here, which is you shouldn't take everything here and immediately apply it to your day job. Uh, you want to think about it and have a discussion with your team. So let's talk about Gusto. Uh, Gusto currently does uh, payroll for 1% of small businesses in the United States. Uh, we move over $1 billion per month. Um, our Rails code base is one of the largest that I've worked with. It's about a million and a half lines of code between the front end and the back end, and that's including our tests. We have over 80 engineers, and we mostly work out of the same monolith. We do this all with the Fisher-Price framework that is Rails. <laughs> uh, one and a half million lines of code is not a small project. Uh, especially when you have a language that allows you to be express as expressive as Ruby does. Um, the domains of payroll benefits and HR are domains with a lot of incidental complexity. This is complexity that is part of the problem, and it's not complexity that, that is our fault. Uh, payroll is a careful balance of time, geography, money, and people. Uh, there are tax jurisdictions that are as small as a city block or as large as a country. Uh, the IRS really gets on your case if you're even off by a single cent. Uh, and obviously, everyone wants, everyone wants to be paid on time. Uh, so unfortunately for Scott's talk, we do have item potent jobs, so you're not going to get paid twice on Gusto. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and because there are people on the other end of our software, uh, we are all human, and we are all constantly making a mistake. Uh, I'm probably making a big mistake right now. This talk is about mistakes. Um, so all of these aspects need to not only be able to be applied, and they change lives, but they also need to be rolled back and corrected when mistakes are made. 
Uh, so for it's, it's for this reason that when given like a very important trade-off uh, in application development, we will always choose correctness over performance. Uh, we need things to work correctly. The IRS needs things to work correctly. Uh, the country needs things to work correctly. Uh, so this is like one of the trade-offs that we make, and this is an important thing to keep in mind uh, when you are looking into what is essentially domain-driven design. Um, so let's talk about how things go wrong and when things get way too big. Like if you are at work and you're like, our Rails monolith is huge, like congratulations, that is a great problem to have. You have a company that exists uh, and it's useful enough to keep around, so great. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of things that work when you're just five engineers uh, in someone's apartment uh, start to break down when you get to 50 engineers or 80 engineers or hundreds of engineers. So I want to talk about the swamp. Swamp is another name for a ball of mud. This is when that Rails monolith gets so large that it becomes very slow to develop in. Startup times can take tens of seconds. Your test week takes you know, tens of minutes, maybe hours. Uh, and you find yourself starting to play whack-a-mole uh, with different parts of the app. You ship one thing, another thing breaks. Uh, you fix that thing, and then something else breaks. Uh, and you start to kind of outgrow some of the paradigms that Rails gives you out of the box, like an app models folder or an app services folder, or an app controllers folder. Uh, and over time, it becomes difficult to make any changes at all. Uh, you might say, like, we're, we, our team is growing, but it feels like we're moving slower. It can feel like you've got your head stuck in a Kleenex box. <laughs> she was fine. Don't worry. So I want to talk about like our swamp. Like what is what does Gusto's swamp look like, right? Like our Rails monolith, uh, which we are still in the process of piecing apart, right? A lot of people will get up here and say, well, not this stage. For I think we're kinder than that. Uh, they will tell you like we switched to service-oriented architecture, everything was great, and we're done. Uh, as we should have learned from Andy, uh, this is a process. This is a dance. Um, so our swamp has like four rough. Domains, We've got payroll, benefits, HR, and infrastructure. Exactly what they do isn't too important. Um, but this is the swamp that we live in. Uh, there are 666 models. Don't read into that number too much. <laughs> and you'll be working like this, and someone might show up, or someone uh, might come back from a conference, and they'll say, let's extract a service. This is a huge swamp that we've got. And you might say, cool. So let's see how that might work, and let's see how uh, we might have done this. Um, so in our case, our team decided to, let's say, extract this HR domain into its own service, its own application. Um, and we chose this because HR is conceptually different than everything else, uh, but it's still related to what you do. So in the, in the world of gusto, right, uh, you might keep someone's name, social security number, and how much they're paid uh, in an HR service, but the payroll service might be in charge of actually paying that person, right? So we're like, okay, let's Rails new up, HRv2. Uh, we've got a brand spanking new Rails app, Rails 5.2, maybe even Track Master, getting really crazy here. Uh, and then you're going to sit down with your team. You're going to slowly connect the existing domain to this new app. Uh, but as you do that. You're like, oh, huh, there's a lot of stuff in HR. There's a lot of stuff there. Huh, yeah, we missed that. And so you get this, like, it feels like you're, you know, the goalposts are constantly moving away from you, right? Uh, and you're not isolated. You're not just a bunch of engineers banging on code. You need to work with your team here. Uh, you have PMs, you have designers, you have the business asking, hey, when is that thing going to be done? Uh, and you're like, well, Soon, right? And this goes on for a little while, and the, the team's getting burnt out. Um, so you say, well, you know what? We've done this pretty well. Uh, HRv2 is, it's got 90% of things uh, moved over. Uh, let's call it quits. Project's done. So you say, we're done. But then you've got a different problem, right? 
which is we set out to extract this one thing from a Rails monolith, and now we've made the problem worse. Rather than there being one place to go look for HR information, now there are two places. There's HR v2, which is really fast, but it's still starting to get slow because you're like, oh, there's a lot of stuff in HR. And now you have this like appendage of like old legacy HR, and chances are it's doing something very important, uh, which is why it's there to begin with and why you're choosing to keep it around. Um, and this is exactly where tribal knowledge comes from uh, in companies. Because now the question of where are names stored or where are social security numbers stored, you have to ask someone. It's not just uh, evident. Uh, from the names or the structure of the code. There's got to be a better way. Uh, we think we are on the right track, but we by no means have the answer. So you might say, tell me more. Uh, so to do so, I want to first make a distinction between applications and services. I think uh, Scott's talk was great. It did a good job of breaking down and trying to provide nomenclature uh, to these things. I should make a note that uh, this nomenclature is going to be a little bit different, uh, but I think the spirit is the same. Um, so you might say applications and services, aren't those the same thing? What's so different about them? Uh, so here are the distinctions that we make between applications and services at Gusto. So an application is something uh, that has its own process, it's its own app. It is like that Rails new, right? A service might just be a module of code. It might be running in process, it might be running out of process. Uh, you might be sending parameters to it via method calls. You might be using something fancy like gRPC or whatever is gonna be cool tomorrow. Usually, uh, applications have their own database. Uh, services probably share a database with the monolith. Applications can scale independently where services scale with the host app. Applications might be in another language. Uh, services are going to share the same language here. Um, and for us, we have a rule uh, that we create a service first and then an application. So Rails new is one of the last commands we run in this process. So let's take a look at how that works. So let's go back to our swamp. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna sit down with the teams who are in charge of these domains. We're gonna sit down with the payroll department, we're gonna sit down with the HR department, we're gonna say conceptually, what is payroll? Conceptually, what is HR? Like what are these things doing? What should they be doing? Uh, what is like the difference between the expected and the actual in terms of how our application is structured? Uh, and we wanna get everyone on the same page, we wanna get them bought into the vision uh, that there is a reason why uh, and there's benefit to breaking these things apart uh, for, for us, we found that it's much easier to maintain these applications. Even sim simple things like routing pages becomes a lot easier uh, once these things are split up. Um, and then once we have like the contours or the, these, uh, these bounded contexts defined, um, we're going to start drawing, explicitly drawing edges. So this is where you move out of using the database as an interface in a normal Rails application. Uh, and you say, we're going to explicitly define every single time payroll talks to HR, and vice versa. Every time HR needs to talk to payroll, or whatever your two domains might be, uh, we want that to be an explicit operation and not just they're both reading out of the same database table. And when we're drawing these lines or traversing these edges here, uh, we're using value objects. Or we have a rule that if, you, if data is coming across one of these lines, we are not passing around an active record instance. As we work, these interfaces are going to become relatively more hardened. It's going to be clearer how these two things interact. And then over time, the decision of should this run on its own box, should this run on its own like uh, uh, fleet of containers, uh, that is a small change. Uh, whether it's running in process or out of process, whether, whether it's running on, on the same host or on a different host, uh, can be configured and reconfigured. When you're doing this, you will introduce new failure modes, which, again, Scott's talk is great uh, to uh, cover those things. Um, but we found this to be a good litmus test of 
did we get the boundaries between uh, our domains correct? If changing a transport layer is a very easy operation, uh, we're, we feel pretty confident uh, in those domains, or in where we drew those seams. So in, his, uh, in the RailsConf keynote this year, uh, DHH talked about this concept of conceptual compression. Uh, I think this is one of the great strengths of Rails. You don't have to think about this stuff for a long time. Uh, Rails is one of, I think, still continues to this day to be one of the most expressive ways of building a web application. Uh, much like Ruby optimizes for developer happiness, I think it also optimizes for developer time. Um, and you get a lot of concepts, you know, just curled up into this nice little ball so that you don't have to worry about writing SQL statements or sanitizing uh, SQL statements or validating data. You get a lot of that for free. Everything is kind of curled up into a little ball here. But we found as your application grows, as you get deeper into your domains, uh, you need to figure out which part of, which parts of, sorry, you need to figure out which parts of Rails you need to start breaking apart. Which concepts do you need to expand? And the four or five things that Active Record handles for you, uh, how do you start breaking those apart and being a little bit more selective about what you choose to use? So these next like five concrete examples are some of the things that we found work for us. Um, they may not work for you. Have a discussion with your team uh, to figure out if this might make sense for you. Our first recommendation, mind and avoid circular dependencies. Um, although we do not have like import and export statements in the Ruby language, uh, we still draw dependency graphs uh, with every line of code that we write. Um, and so for us, as we grow our Rails applications, we actually have started to question bidirectional relationships. Uh, so from a code perspective, you know, this is a very simple, uh, very simple like two uh, active record models that you might see in an application. Um, we've started to ask the question, do we really need that other direction, right? Or whenever we have an employee, are we already operating within the context of a company? Uh, we do this because bidirectional relationships, by their definition, create circular dependencies. Uh, these circular dependencies are what a ball of mud is made out of. If you took a microscope and zoomed into a ball of mud, you'd just see a lot of active record relationships and other things like that very coupled together. So we ask ourselves, can we drop one of those lines? Not always perfect, uh, but nonetheless a good discussion to have to uh, improve the design here. Recommendation number two, whenever you are communicating between services, uh, use value objects to traverse those edges. Um, so let's take another look at a very simple uh, service class. So this is a service class that uh, has, uh, handles what happens after a company signs up. Uh, we're going to send an email using the company mailer class, uh, and we're going to, you know, track some stats through the stats tracker class. Um, and this looks like perfectly normal Rails code. And actually, I would say it's a it's perfectly fine Rails code for uh, small applications uh, when everyone's when speed is more important uh, than maintainability. Um, but if we look at this in depth, we'll notice that we've actually coupled company mailer and stats tracker, uh, the two classes here, uh, tightly to the structure or the shape of our company active record. And so the problem here is that now if we ever want to change the shape of company, we need to go and make changes in several different places, and that has a name that is called shotgun surgery. Uh, so instead, we always ask ourselves the question, when is the, re when is the best time uh, to bail out of active record and just go down to pure values? or uh, value objects. Sometimes this might just be strings and integers. Sometimes we'll actually build up uh, plain old Ruby objects or poros uh, to represent uh, what we are trying to pass around. And now we only need to make a change in one class should the shape of that company active record ever change. Third recommendation, callbacks. Try to avoid them. Um, 
Callbacks are incredibly powerful in Rails applications. Uh, you would kind of get the sense that it's hard to write a model that does anything interesting without them. Um, but their expressiveness comes at a cost. So I want to talk about that cost, and I want to talk about how, why we say generally avoid them. So let's look at, again, company model here. After a company signs up, uh, we want to send a welcome email. Let's not, uh, let's ignore the fact that, uh, you know, we might be using a third party uh, mailer behind here and we're cut, like tying the ability to create a company to is that other service online. Also, never mind the fact that we should probably be using an after commit with a background job. Just bear with me here. Um, so if we look at the, at the dependency graph that we just drew with that, that Ruby code, uh, again, circular dependency. And this one's even a little bit more sinister than even bidirectional relationships, because here we have two different layers of our application, uh, like the model layer and the mailer layer. Uh, they're now coupled together. Um, they know too much about each other. And again, this is not a problem immediately. This is a problem when you go to change the thing. So instead, uh, we reach for service objects. We've got a lot of service objects. I mean, one and a half million lines of code, we have to, you gotta write those somehow. Um, so we reach for composable service objects. Uh, and here, so rather than having the company model know about this mailer layer, uh, we have something else, a create company service object uh, that knows how to create a company and it knows how to take care of that email that we wanna send uh, afterward. If we look at the dependency graph of that, uh, we have a new node. We have three nodes now instead of two. Uh, but the trade-off that we've decided to make is that it's better to add a new node to a dependency graph than to create a cycle because the cycles are what makes it hard to change. Fourth recommendation, services first, then applications. Try to get these boundaries around parts of your app drawn and hardened uh, before you type that Rails new command. Uh, and when you type that Rails new command, make sure there is nothing left over from the previous service. Fifth recommendation, move slowly. This stuff takes time. Uh, for one of the pieces of the app that we applied this to, uh, it took us six months and 500 pull requests. Uh, we set a vision of where we wanted to end up. We didn't know really how we were going to get there or necessarily how long it would take. Uh, but we had the buy-in uh, of our team and of the company. Uh, and we were able to gracefully do this and never missed a beat. We were still transacting every single payroll through the system while we did this process. Always move incrementally, no matter how bad the code may be. Uh, Rails newing a microservice is akin to like a big rewrite, whether you realize it or not. You have to stick with what you have today rather than starting to build, trying to build something from scratch. So in the words of Kent Beck, you should always be looking to make the hard change easy when breaking apart a Rails monolith. That is going to be hard. Uh, you're going to have to unlearn some things that uh, you've been doing for years. And then you want to make the easy change. Uh, you can't do this without a great team. Uh, and there, this is not something that you can break easily down into like a series of stories or points. Uh, so it'll take a while. Trust your team. Uh, and uh, good luck. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>